Welcome everyone to the Regenerative Insights Circle. And I'm happy to welcome Carl Welty and Paul Riles, who are going to talk about regenerative design and architecture. And they're going to take us back into some interesting examples. They're going to take us on a wild ride, I hope. So just to set the frame here, these discussions are about appreciative inquiry, building on the ideas of others. The goal is to listen, understand, ask questions, elaborate, build on. That's the spirit that we like to run the meetings in. We're going to try and hold questions unless you have a, a direct clarifying question for Carl and Boyom. And because you are all experts in regeneration as well, comments are welcome. Of course, your own experience, bring it in. So let's see. I think that's all we have to say for now. So let me pass it over to Carl and Poyom. Welcome. And thanks so much for putting all this work into it. You're going to present on a topic that we've been talking about in these meetings for some time. So I'm looking forward to it. Floor is thank yours. You. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for all your support. And thank, thank, thank you for the community for for attending and all of your wonderful insights over the last few months that I've been participating. So let me share my screen and get started. So I'm, I'm, my name is Carl, I'm an architect and my presentation partner, Riles, is a civil engineer with a specialty in <coughs> hydrology and civil engineering. Uh, just a quick note, the, the image behind this is a drawing from an Egyptian carving that people suspect that it was a little house with wind scoops on it. So, which is a really great strategy for passive cooling. I'll introduce myself too. I'm Poyom, Poyom Riles. I'm a civil Sorry. engineer and involved in regenerative design. And Carl and I sort of came together through some of these meetings and similar interest in design, decided to present some of these ideas to the group. And we're committed to doing this type of, of design. So in the presentation, we've chosen this title, Rooting Human Ecosystems in Nature for an Affordable, Resilient, and Accessible Low-Carbon Future. Throughout the presentation, we're going to present a description of what we mean by regenerative design, some regenerative design principles. We'll describe how that contrasts with conventional design and present some case studies throughout to illustrate those those principles and ideas, including some historical and modern day examples that are important for regenerative design. So just to sort of frame the conversation, if you, if you're not familiar with this figure, don't, don't worry. It can look a little bit complicated. The important parts are there's this arrow going through the axis where on the left side, it's degenerating on the right side, it's regenerating. And really the column on the right is, is the important part here that there's this scale of, of our activity. This, this is sort of framed in the context of design, but really just regenerative. Something could be sustainable, which means things sort of stay the same. They don't get worse. They don't necessarily get better. So, you know, restorative is we might be doing something to make things better. Reconciliatory means we might actually be recognized that we're sort of part of the system and operating within it. And regenerative means we're actually acting as if we're part of, of nature. And you can see all the way down at the bottom, it's conventional. So that just sort of frames that. You know, there's a lot of people who, you know, who talk about regenerative design. I mean, here we are in the, the regenerative group. And so there's a lot of ways to define it. I, I like to use this concept of the design that encourages and supports the flourishing of the inherent essence of the object or place. I think I probably picked that up from Carol Sanford, but there's also that diagram in the previous slide was from Daniel Christian Wall. Um, Regenesis Group has done quite a bit of work with regenerative design as well. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with these names, but if you're not, they're definitely worth checking out. So I think Carl's going to take us through some regenerative design principles. I just add, this is an idea that I think is fundamental. The starting point is try to understand how a, the sun moves across the site and how water moves across the site, which is the obvious thing, the two essential elements for life. But I think this is a really fundamental part of regenerative architectural design and site design. And from this, one can then start thinking about sort of more energy efficient and more capturing stormwater for, for optimal use. The water and energy are critical. There are a few other pieces that we use as part of designing an integrated system. We take into account 
climate system like wind, Carl mentioned before, the topo topography of the place kind of includes water, but there's other aspects, geology, ecosystem, sort of access routes. The reason for including all of these different systems in our design is really we're focusing on centering the welfare and the well-being of all of the inhabitants of that place. And, you know, here we have in these bullets a few examples of ways that integrated designs can be operating. And throughout this discussion, we're going to discuss some of these in depth, some of these, these bullet points. I'll just add that the, the background image is an artist's rendition of the description of Socrates' house, who, who looks a lot like the diagrams from passive solar houses from the 70s. It's, you know, it's just about designing a house that orients to the south and shades the structure from <clears throat> the summer sun, but lets the winter sun in. And, uh, you know, when we're talking about bringing all of these different aspects into the design, we're integrating ourselves with all of these different systems. So it requires a systemic level of thinking of interoperating systems. It requires a long-term thinking. We can't work on a short sort of 10, 20 year time scale with these kind of designs. And, you know, from the slide here, it's interesting to see the scientifically air conditioned theater. Often, often regenerative design is more cost effective in the long term. And oftentimes, even in the short term, it's more cost effective than conventional design. And air conditioning is one of those key features, but there's others as well. And a lot of these, the technology available for us to use in regenerative design is, is well tested. It's not futuristic technology necessarily. Um, you know, there are things that have not been invented yet that will support us long into the future, but, but so much of what we need to do regenerative design has, has been done and it's, it's valuable for us to look back to use those examples as guides to how to live in a place sustainably low energy. I think one thing I'd mentioned there is that in the past, people were forced by necessity to live in a way with low impact in order to make use of what they had through different means, petroleum or what other sort of in things that have been, that are sort of, we use in our modern society, we aren't forced in that way to, by necessity, to use the most efficient method possible, right? It, it obviously isn't the most efficient thing to get a new iPhone every five years. It's just an add that the uh, <clears throat> air conditioning refrigeration, I think of it as the, the last important technology now a hundred years old that really did, uh, allowed us to disconnect from nature. This, I wanted to just do to, to a brief sort of set a little point that ancient cultures all have uh, this universalness or they have a many gods, but they all have a, a water deity and a, a sun deity. This is a really powerful image, which is a Buddha statue sitting on a lotus, which is a symbol of, of renewal and water, but also it's, it has been underwater for 600 years, but because of the level of the Yangtze river, it's now exposed. That's pretty profound. An example of the sun gods or sun, sun deities from Egypt, which we're probably all familiar with, but, and then just two examples of how ancient civilizations built to connect to the sun and to nature, Stonehenge, which we all know in the markings of the equinox, and, but uh, also the Chaco Canyon in New Mexico has extraordinary examples of aligning with nature and the sun. And I might add too, that this aspect of connecting both the, the design, whether it's architectural design or infrastructure design or landscape design to the, the aspects of nature helps us integrate into those aspects of nature, us identifying with these aspects of nature. There's this part of regenerative design. It's very hard to sort of define, but it's us sort of reintegrating and acting as nature. Our essential essence is taken by molding ourselves to the essential parts of the place, like the water and the sun. We're also not the first people to question if we might put too much confidence in machines. This is a wonderful image of Charlie Chaplin with the from the, a movie from the early 20s, 1920s. Uh, just a quick note, this is a, this is a for me, a, a 
an example of too much confidence in our technology that from the you know, U.S. Energy Information Administration, there's a projection that our buildings in the next 25 years use less energy, but they project, you know, 0.4% less energy per year, which it doesn't sound very much compared to if we built buildings to work with nature, we could immediately make buildings 50 to 80 percent more efficient without using any power and more cost effective conventional design for me is imposing geometric patterns over nature large part of how i think about things and sort of question our approach in, in modern world cars and streets are prioritized over nature and humans geometric patterns require more infrastructure to drain and, and provide all the systems that are invisible to us but yet are more expensive decorative non-functioning landscapes produce poor, poor, poor soil health, but also it's a missed opportunity to use landscape, integrate landscape with water and the landscapes to shade buildings to improve energy efficiency. The, the, the image behind we'll talk more about, but it's, it's a, a radial design from the hundreds in Italy. So in conventional design, when we build communities without paying attention to nature, we have all these, there's systems but that are required to, to make our life possible. But because we don't integrate this thinking from the beginning, the, the resulting, so sort of the impact is there's more grading required if, as opposed to working with this natural slope, more drainage pipes, which we'll talk about more, but we have mechanical systems, solar panels, and, and now battery backup. But so by integrating these, this thinking that we're talking about, we're going to show how the, the concrete pipes can be eliminated, all the the solar panels and the machines can be much reduced. And so this is the, the reducing these things and eliminating the grading is how, is why the examples that we're going to show are more cost effective. So I'm going to do a quick introduction to passive solar. This could be a whole presentation if interested, but it's, it's a simple principle. It's, it's, and this is again, the Socrates' house, but it's just working with knowing that the sun is higher in the summer and lower in the winter by designing buildings to keep the sun or sun out and let the winter sun in and a few other things. This is the key to making buildings that are 50 to 80% more efficient than normal without increasing construction cost. The house I designed in Santa Monica, the cl clients reported not using any, any energy for heating and cooling. That's really great, yay me, but in Santa Monica, it's extraordinarily easy because of the mild temperature. The point is that in California, that we could do so much with passive with heating and cooling to reduce our energy demand. This is a building designed by an old professor of mine from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, who's kind of an extraordinary leader in this and who's been doing this for 60 years, but it's a synagogue in San Luis Obispo and designed completely without air conditioning system, yet it's, it's demonstrated that it's kept cool in a building with air conditioning. And to, to reference back to the 0.4% better, I would say that a building without an air conditioning system at all is a whole lot better than 0.4% better. So that, that this is really an extraordinary example of what's possible. And, and San Luis Obispo is 15 miles from the coast, so it's about the same temperature as downtown Los Angeles. Not as hot as some parts of California, but pretty warm. So the site design for a project, if you're doing a development, is incredibly important part of the integrated aspect of the design. You're talking about integrating these systems. And it incorporates sort of a site assessment where you sort of look at all the different systems or for your permaculture, maybe you talk about different sectors. And then also there's a process of participant engagement. So you do some kind of stakeholder engagement to find out what's needed on the site. And so the site assessment sort of finds out what's needed from geographical, geological, sort of ecological perspective about the climate as well. And then also you talk to the human inhabitants people who are going to be affected by the development, what, what's, what's needed there to integrate all of these different systems. And there's some key pieces that you're, you're trying to achieve for an integrated regenerative design. You want to reduce permeable surfaces. You want to gain space for the existing ecology where, wherever possible. And this will include reducing roadways, reducing building footprints. You can see in this image on the left, the lower corner is, is a sort of conventional lots and the upper uh, above that are smaller lots 
you know, the actual parcel size could be the same, but the development area is reduced to maintain the integrity of, of the existing system. I just want to add, and this is what's been great to me calling him from what I know, the conventional process of development is the water, the drainage system. It's done as an afterthought. It's never considered as part of the initial site design. And so our two case studies that we're going to show really demonstrate very well the extraordinarily cost effective and cost benefits and ecological benefits of working with people like Poyum from the very beginning. To me, these are two sort of opposite extremes or you know, examples of site design. The one on the right, which is all too common, you know, it's, it's a radial design. The architects is an example of geometry overlaid nature without considering the sun, without considering the topography and drainage. This sort of site design, I would assert <laughs> that this approach always costs more. Versus the village homes, we're going to talk about the entire site was done in a really integrated way and the streets are oriented to maximize solar gain and with, with much attention to how water moves. And we're going to see how, hopefully we'll show how the extraordinary ecological, this is a little bit of history, the, the radial design that's what I say all too common. The origin really is Italian defense towns, military towns from the 1500s. So it's a, it's a rooted in a, a cultural history, but it's a geometry opposed over nature. The reason for this is military, but the, the point is that when we do this, we're working with a pattern that's maybe not part of nature. So this is a quick introduction to art history, <laughs> but for me, an important part of Western culture. Western European history and architecture is this invention of the perspective, which has happened in 1413. And there's a quick diagram on the right to show how Brunelleschi demonstrated the rules of perspective. And this is the rules that as an architecture student, we're taught to draw, but this visual representation really took off with the Renaissance and has shaped European urban design. So these are three really important paintings that kind of encapsulate the ideas that has shaped European urban design since the 1500s. So these are three paintings of the, the ideal city. So within these paintings, you know, they're, they're paintings that artists were playing around with one point perspective, but this is the embodiment of what we think in the West is beautiful cities. So like idea of buildings the same size on both sides of the street and a monumental object at the end of a boulevard or an axe. So this is. I, th I think this is the origin of what we think of as beautiful cities and, and is the antithesis of thinking about making buildings or making planning cities that are part of connected to nature. Uh, this is often considered the first Renaissance base with 1459 in Pienza, Italy. The part of history is this was designed for the then Pope. I would also make a point that the idea of using this sort of this geometric, imposing a geometric order over nature and or a city in this case, there's a long tradition of people like Popes and Hitler and <laughs> Stalins and people to like that, to impose their, their will and power over people and nature through geometric order. Another example is the Uffizi Gallery, which was really first built as the city hall of Florence. Many people consider it the first Renaissance street where the buildings are the same size on both sides. A quick note about the, the radial design, again, this is the Epcot Center, Epcot design for 1963. The yellow markings are the, the parts of this community that this, the buildings and streets would have optimal solar orientation of east-west. So only about 30% of the, the buildings would have maximum or optimal solar orientation. Plus the drainage, the drainage of this system, this city would be much more expensive. Two examples of pre-Renaissance thinking of cities that were oriented to the sun. Most cities, most Greek cities built after 350 BC were oriented to the south. And also you would notice that they don't have, they don't have large boulevards like Paris with an, a monument at the end. And, and another example is the Chinese city from even older. So there, there are, so to speak about water, 
a little bit. There's a lot that we can learn from sort of low tech solutions from from the past. They were implemented out of necessity, but they were very effective. Some of you may be familiar with the Kanat in the Middle East and the the, the sort of typical physics of water under normal conditions has been well known for a very long time. What's less well understood in our in our sort of modern scientific canon is is the effect within biology, within ecology, with to the climate and 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 even something that's not really even addressed scientifically is the the structure of water and how that might affect biology. Water is a very complex element and and specifically the persistent pollutants are are a very serious problem in stormwater treatment or just any water treatment and I, I really think that biology is the key to that. You know, we have modern examples of tools that we can use for water treatment that are very simple. And they take a, a, a sort of looking at nature and how does how does nature do these things? So here's a couple of examples of what typically in my field we call green infrastructure or LID, low impact development. And on the left is Yale Avenue in Seattle. On the right is Donnelly Avenue in Burlingame. And then below, there's a diagram from Puget Sound, Seattle, I think. The key, and I'm sure many of you have heard this, is the slow it, spread it, sink it. So uh, we, we, you know, we need to be aware of floods, but we, this, there's, there's a yield that we can achieve from slowing down stormwater that, that is critical. So these are just, on this slide, there's just some additional examples from history of, of stormwater management and capture. Just a quick note, this is in looking for examples of water building orientation or integration. This is a beautiful example from, from India, from 2500 BC of a city that's oriented correctly, but, but located in design to take advantage of two water sources. And this is, this is really the embodiment of what we're going to talk about in village homes, but it's the combination of solar orientation and water. Some quick examples of passive solar thermally, thermal design using nature, wind scoops from India, ancient Rome, a building that's really beautifully designed to, as a kind of a clock that where the, the sun moves around in, into these niches throughout the day, the wind cooling tower from Persia and the cliff dwellings in the Southwest, which were located in cliffs where they used the cliff to shade the buildings in the summer. This is uh, just a quick example of the, the integrated thinking from ancient Persia, where <clears throat> they integrate thermal principles, ventilation and you know, venting a building to cool the building, and, but also water. So introducing water through a, an underground canal that, and then using that cool air and the, the, the water for cooling the air. This is a building I designed. This has been, it was an important introduction for me about water. It's a, a water conservation education center for our water conservation agency. Many ideas about connecting building the people to nature, but particularly also a, a, a wind cooling tower for ventilation. And in the in, interior, putting, locating windows to bring in sunlight in different times of the day and different times of the year so that the sunlight in a subtle way increases their awareness of how the sun moves. And a picture of a, a downspout that mimics a tree. So Village Homes in Davis is an amazing case study. It was started in 1975, completed in 1981. It's about 70 acres. It's about 225 single family homes and 20 apartments. There was an extensive stakeholder engagement process that the architect went through in the development. And, and during the process of that development in, the, in those sort of six years, there was an, a lot of pushback from the city because of the unconventional me drainage methods that they used. They didn't have drain pipes. They were having shared yards. You can see this sort of drainage between the between the houses there's a lot of features of village homes that 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 make it such an incredible place it it has a lot of amenities there's a daycare center a community center a community swimming pool locally owned cafe there's a large central park there's little pocket parks there's community gardens with fruit trees and nut trees there's grape vineyards the apartments they're affordable apartments there's an office space dance studio and daycare I think the daycare is no longer active, but it was. 
And some of the innovations of this village homes are the edible landscaping it, it, with yeah, as part of a housing development, natural drainage and infiltration, solar oriented streets to, to allow for the solar oriented houses, passive solar architecture, the limited street widths, uh, lots of pedestrian and bike paths, and a lot of open common land. So in the second year of, if we go back one slide, Carl, in the second year of the, the city, they actually, there was a, the drainage system from village homes, these swales in between the houses were able to relieve a lot of the flooding from the city. There was a huge storm event and the, this village homes was actually able to get this large bond that they had to give to the city because the city was so concerned about the development. They were able to get that bond back because this, they were able to demonstrate that they were actually a benefit to the city during a flooding situation. The flooding event that Boeing was talking about, Village Homes was, even though the city was concerned that the system would work, Village Homes was one of the few developments in Davis that did not flood. And they, and they reduced the flooding elsewhere. And so you can see here this house, you can see the solar design. I mean, I guess if you know what to look for, all of the homes were, were designed to be passive solar. The energy contributes to, to between 50 and 75% of, of all the heat needs. Most of the houses don't have AC. You know, they have, a, some of them have a thermal mass wall, special curtains and some different things like that. If I um, add that it's this integration of the landscape is part of the energy system. So it's the integration of all of these systems that we're talking about contribute to a community where the ambient temperature in the neighborhood is 10 to 15 degrees less in the summer, which obviously is an essential part of allowing the homes to be cooled without air conditioning. Yeah. And I, I mentioned there's a lot of open land. The, the, this op, the commonly owned open land space is, is about 40% of the total acreage of the community. So 25% of that is like green belt and about 15% is in common areas. And here in this image, you can see what they did with the reduced street widths. They used parking bays within the streets to keep the streets narrow, which meant like less asphalt, more green space. And all of this green space, the water harvesting to sort of increase the hydration of the vegetation, it keeps the whole development 10 to 15 degrees cooler in the summertime. And the minimum street widths, they also minimize the use of the automobile so they conserve fossil fuels. They're quieter, they're safer, they're cooler, there's less noise, it's more beautiful. You know, there's all kinds of benefits to reducing those street widths. In addition, this, you know, incorporating the food, there's like multiple community gardens, the vineyards, the orchards. Residents are free to harvest the orchards and the vineyards and the community gardens. There are also private gardens that residents have that they can garden on their own. And this local food, it builds community, but it also circulates capital, right? Because it redu and it reduces the complexity of the supply chain in the fact that you could just go out your door and get some food. But that also this harvesting the local food, like together in that last slide, you could see it brings people together, right? It creates a sense of community. In addition to the benefits of fresh food, you know, widely available fresh food for children and ev everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. some, some of the residents say that 70% of the annual food production comes from the, the site. This is just a quick example of a project, a project in Claremont that I'm quite familiar with, and they did a lot of analysis. It incorporated some of the same, the, the primary principles, which is they worked with a natural slope to, to which, which reduce, reduce grading, and the and the, the it was designed. The streets are designed for east-west for solar orientation, but the site drains on the surface, so there are no concrete drain pipes. Example of green infrastructure. One, one thing I'd say here is there's, there's several benefits to mimicking the dry creek bed or, or using some kind of rain garden. The system does this natural filtration, but also by bringing in the elements of what it would look like in a natural system, you're helping people connect to that natural place by identifying with the way things are naturally. And then you're also adding habitat because you know there are species that will automatically 
sort of, oh, you know, lizards like to live in a certain way or something like that. This is a comparison of Village Home with this project on my right that looks more regular with the streets kind of on a grid. That's the Meadowood. This is a, using this the, the development, more conventional development from this period, which is the 80s, as an example of it. You know, this is a pattern that's common in America now where the streets are curvy to sort of be like nature. But the reality is that the conventional development <clears throat> required 3,000 linear feet of storm drain pipes underground versus in the Meadowood project, there are no storm drains underground. So, so I think that, and we'll, we'll talk about this later, but the cost savings of working with nature are really quite extraordinary. But so this, so, so the development on the left, the conventional development, it's an example of a geometry imposed over nature, even though the streets are curvy and look like nature, it's still a geometry imposed over nature without considering how nature works and that that's always less efficient. So example, so, so I've carefully measured, so the Meadowood development, there are 28 linear feet of storm drain inlets for 40 acres versus the other 40 acres, there's 130 linear feet of storm drain pipes over the same area. <clears throat> and the, 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 because this, the, the Meadowood development was designed like village homes, where there's more permeable surface and there's in the, 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 the dry creek bed, which is beautiful, is, 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 is functions very well to put water back into the ground. The conventional street width is 44 to 50 feet versus in Meadowood and Village Homes, the typical street width is 20 to 24 feet, reducing the, the temperature and but also saving a lot of money in development costs and making a more human friendly environment. And, and increasing the, green, the amount of green space for people. And then similarly, you know, there's like these shared community spaces, that's additional resources for people, shared abundance, provides community gathering space, builds community and, and, and access to, uh, to a green space that has implications in mental health. So the cost benefits of this approach, both village homes and Meadowood demonstrate these. So both Meadowood and village homes, there are zero, there's zero concrete drain pipe. So, so, this, so it's not just the cost of the drain pipe, but the engineering that's required to design it and to install it much more excavation. So <clears throat> a point of the cost savings of these natural systems is to project that by in today's dollars, the less, the reduced infrastructure saved almost $3 million in village homes and a little over $2 million in, in, in Meadowood. So in village homes, they actually saved $200,000 because they didn't have to buy any green concrete drain pipes. And they used that $200,000 to purchase 300 fruit trees, which was the beginning of their extraordinarily successful ecosystem of today. Lifespan costs, the, the savings of reduced energy, reduced, you know, either smaller heating and cooling systems are no cooling systems, reduced cost for imported water. And, and there's a, lots of ecological benefits. It's a lot more resilient, less, less energy required to heat and cool. If you include the food, there's a huge factor of resilience there. The community cohesion provides an incredible amount of resilience. And then you talk about, you know, how it could affect local habitats or local ecologies. There's, that's a, it also an incredible amount of, of, of impact and the amount of water that's stored underground has a, has a huge impact, especially in California where you talk about droughts. Yes. The, and then the social aspect too, there was a study that was done in 2002 and, and village homes that found that people had better social connections. A quick reference back to Charlie Chaplin as an uh, uh, alternative to being ground down by a, a gear, the, the social benefits of living and working with nature. I love this quote, sometimes we think too much and feel too little, Charlie Chaplin. So the obvious social benefit of village home, the me spiritual metaphysical benefits of nature. And, and that gets back to this sort of idea of how, how do we see ourselves as nature and acting as nature? And there's more, right? There's more that we can do besides what we've seen here. There could be more in ecological integration. We could preface the, the development by building on degraded sites and, and restoring those sites. Um, there, there's, all, there's all kinds of things that, that we could do more. And, and I, I kind of want to add in there that 
you know, when we talk about regenerative design, we're aiming for regenerative design. We're talking about a pathway. How, how, do, we, how do we move up that scale from sustainable? So if, if, you know, if you have further questions and you want to follow up, please reach out to us. We'd love any feedback on the presentation. Or if you have any additional case studies that you think you should share with us, you might want us to include in a future presentation. We'd love that. And, uh, and you know, both of us are certified professionals ready to design whatever you need us to design for you. So please reach out for any, anything, any needs in that way as well. Thank you so much. I, the, the point about certified professionals, Poyam and I, you know, when I first met Poyam on these calls, I, I realized here's a, here's a, 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 an engineer who gets it. And, and, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to want to do these things, but it's quite different. And this sounds like a, this is certainly a worldview from a professional, but it requires an, an understanding of codes to make these things happen, to get them approved. So anyways, that's, thank you so much. Thank you, Carl. Well, I've got Pam first and then Aaron. Go ahead, Pam. I just wanted to say thank you so much. It was so impressive. I really enjoyed it. Such a great deal. And Inquiring Systems, who I work for, our founder built his house facing south for these exact reasons. And he was a proponent of this type of design. And he was also from the 70s. And, and when all of that was probably was seen as a fad by some, but it turns out to have just been foundationally good design. So thank you for keeping this alive. Aaron, you're next. No real question. Just want to say I appreciate the presentation very much. And I would love to organize a tour of village homes. I'm ready to go. That would be awesome. <laughs> We actually know some people that live there, so we could we could get a tour from the inside. I used to live in Elk Grove. It's about, I think it's like 10 miles south and like five miles east of Davis. Pretty much the same climate. We moved into a house that was six, built six months ago. Like, so six month old house we were renting. Elk Grove used to be a farm town. I don't know if anyone knows the history there. This was 2002. 2001, it was a farm town. And in 2004, it was a suburb. It was the fastest growing town in America for a while. It was constant construction, residential complexes, suburban residences everywhere, right? Our experience living there, we lived there for about two years, was very strange. Now the house was gorgeous, beautiful, large house, four bedroom, two bath, a marble, all that stuff. Very high R value, like R30, R40, something like that. The house was built extremely tight. If you slammed the front door with all the windows closed, your ears would pop. That's how tight it was. So. Amazing insulation, central air conditioning, all that stuff, which was absolutely necessary because in the summer it would just bake. 90s to 100s, we had 20 straight days. It actually broke a record that's not atypical now of over 100 degree temperature highs, all right? 20 days straight. It's just basically, it's very difficult to survive without air conditioning with that. So we definitely needed the air conditioning. Yeah, the insulation value helped reduce the air conditioning cost, but it was mandatory that we have an air conditioner or else we, it would not be livable. So that the cost of the electricity is built in. So during the winter time, when it would rain, was a completely different story. Um, surrounding the whole area and, and previous to the suburbs was basically marsh ranch land. You know, there was a little bit of farming, but mostly it was too wet for farming. So they had a bunch of cows standing in mud most of the year. And that's what we saw while we were there in other areas. What they did to achieve the viability of building suburbs was they would install pumps in every neighborhood. And the pumps would run 24-7 all the time. These are giant complexes. I mean, huge buildings, like bigger than the houses, housing these pumps. And you'd hear them at night pumping, room, 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 room. And when it would rain, it would get louder and louder because they'd be working harder. But we had a rainstorm once. It was a pretty bad rainstorm. And uh, things just barely started to flood. All the surrounding ranch land was flooded, basically. I, I basically couldn't drive to work in a Rancho Cordova during that route because it was flooded out. What happened with the suburbs, because the pumps were going, is the ground became like a sponge. You would walk on it and it would be and it would actually go down. It wasn't just grass. It was like the soil itself, the surfaces would become really springy and spongy because they were so super saturated. Now, if that pump ever broke, that whole neighborhood would flood immediately. Exactly the point. We rely on the machine to solve it. So in Davis, with Village Homes, and actually I have some great video from somebody who lives in Village Homes who filmed an atmospheric river rain event last year. 
which is which is like the worst it can be. It was five inches of rain in 24 hours, and that natural system without pumps, without energy, didn't flood. It worked. That's amazing. It just shows like we're talking about thinking too much. Uh, how about engineering too much? It's like they're not oh. engineering forward with nature at all, but they are practicing some sophisticated engineering just to pull that off and to make a heck of a lot of money. You know, when I when I met Poyam, who's a hydrological engineer, and clearly he was on these calls because he's interested in this. You know, I like. Woohoo! Somebody who knows how to solve the problem technically, I can map it out. But but it's it's the combination of working with people like Boyum to solve those problems without the freaking pumps. This is why yeah. I mean that this like in that site, the cost of that engineering was astronomical. I mean the cost of that development was millions and millions of dollars, and it will continue to cost a lot of money to maintain. And We're there's an important piece about how. The houses and village homes were designed to be affordable. They weren't huge houses. And the value of that regenerative design was actually passed on to the homeowner because they were sold at a moderate price and they're now worth a lot. It's hard to get into village homes because they're very valuable. And all that value was actually passed on to the homeowners, not the developer who said, oh, I'm going to build a really big house that requires a lot of air conditioning and all this other infrastructure. So I, th I think that's also a very important aspect to the development. Let's go to Colleen as been patient. Go ahead, Colleen. <laughs> um, when we're talking about being oriented to the sun, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to have the front of the house or the back of the house or the side of the house to the sun, right? Just so long as that has actually happening. <clears throat> in both of those, both those projects we're talking about, they, you know, there's some houses are designed where the sun is in the back and some in the front. I've been thinking, you know, I mean, the village that we're going to be building is up in the mountains and we're going to have to deal with the topography of the land and it won't be ideal in some cases, but as long as, you know, we can still have a side of the house that's oriented correctly and have the amount of solar gain that's required in the winter time and some ability to hold that heat. I think that that's going to be the important aspect of it. Also, we have permaculture designers that are going to be working with us on the landscaping, and a lot of them are really excited about working with people like you who are doing this kind of building. And so some of the design things that the permaculture people are thinking about might be a little different. Like for instance, they don't like putting you up on the top of a hill. They don't like putting you down in the valley. They like, you know, if there's a, like a little shelf somewhere they can put you on, they're happier about that. And I'm sure that this is all part of what you guys do as well. In, fact, you know, in reading about how the Greeks built solar oriented cities, 3,000 years ago, there's a note that they were able to do it even when the topography was difficult. So <laughs> these are all variables that can be incorporated with thoughtful, sensitive design. One point about village homes, Jeff Lawton, the, you know, the permaculture institute in Australia, he actually, he thinks that village homes should be a world heritage site. So village homes is an example of, they got all the basic principles 90% right. <laughs> Colleen, you mentioned about the topography, your road design, if you have, if you're, if you're restricted by the topography, the road design will be critical for getting your drainage so that you yes. don't have to use as many culverts or as much piping. And there are already seven ponds on this property wow. and we may want to rethink some of that. You know, we just want to kind of start from ground zero and figure out what needs to happen. This interdisciplinary approach is really critical. Let's go to Nick and I'm going to close off discussion in just a couple minutes. Go ahead, Nick. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Excellent presentation. Regenerative designer as well. And so I appreciate hearing other people's stories. My question is about the nuance of your relationship to your clients. I find it, I get a lot of sort of early adopters, you know, people that have some green values and that's what's driving them to me. But I find higher up the economic food chain, I interact like the more it's kind of just pure economic logic. And I'm wondering, I find, tension within myself around 
just sticking to the part of me that's like, well, this is just the logical thing to do. It's just pure rationality versus also because I am a nature lover, right? And to me, like the biophilia is what drives me in this direction. Yet I find myself almost like restraining my biophiliac proselytizing because it's, it's like, I don't want to scare anyone yet. Ultimately, I find myself a little disappointed if it's just like a venture capital consortium that has no central soul that cares about nature and they're just trying to get through CEQA. You know what? I'm just curious to hear a tidbit about what that, if there's tension there for you and how you navigate it. These ideas are part of, and I try to talk about passive solar. So when I say with strong conviction that if we pay attention to these basic principles, it's cheaper. It's, and this is what we're trying to present all the evidence of you know, why it's cheaper. And I mean, also add that concerned and critical of our profession where we're taught too much. We've convinced the world, including the financial people that you're talking about, that green might be good, but it costs more. And that's not going to save our place on the planet. We have to present a logical argument that green's regenerative design is cost effective. This is absolutely critical. This is a really key part of this presentation. Working with nature costs less. Yeah, absolutely. And there are tools that we can use to show that. And then also that part of that conversation is talking about time scale, talking about maintenance costs. You know, there's, there's all these other factors and it's difficult. I've been in this struggle that you're talking about, Nick. I've also experienced many times your clients vet you, <laughs> sometimes you need to vet your clients and it's struggle when you're trying to make ends meet. So that can also be difficult. And a, a lot of it is education too. I mean, I know you, you probably know this, but it can be difficult to express these ideas because some of them are complex. And when you say, oh, well, we want to use this type of grass that's native and it costs three times as much as, you know, some conventional invasive species, it's hard to convince somebody who that is not gone through that paradigm shift that it's worth that money because they don't see the benefit on their end because they don't see themselves as part of a larger system that in the end, it actually will be better for them. But that's a tough one. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say thanks, Andrew, for hosting. Yes, thank you, Andrew. And um, if anybody wants to but, reach out, please, please do so. If you have more questions or comments or anything. Thank you, Poyom, and thank you, Carl. Great presentation. Thank you, everyone who attended and also added to the presentation. So as usual, we'll have a link to the video in the GR Soup chat, and we'll have a group picture too somewhere along the way. So thank you, everyone.